All right, y'all, so the point of this video is we're going to approximate how much force does a pitcher exert when throwing a 90 mile per hour fastball, right? So we're talking about a pitcher on the pitcher mound. He starts here, he takes a throw. How much force does he have to exert on the ball when he is throwing it? Now, I understand this is not a baseball. This is a uh, pickleball, so here's to you, Gavin. All right, so uh, we're going to pretend that it's a baseball. Baseball has a mass of 150 grams, so that's 0 0.150 kilograms. And I have already done the calculation here of turning 90 miles per hour into 40.2 meters per second. So that's our SI units. But what I want to show you with this is that the same things that we were doing previously with energy, with our toys, are the same physics that we're going to be using when we start talking about the physics of sports. All right, so here's our introduction. Now, what I've done is I've, we're going to have to gather a little bit more information in order to be able to figure this out, okay? Um, I've assumed that I start, the pitcher starts here, and that as he throws, he pulls the ball up to here, and you can see that I've marked that spot right here. So as he winds up, he brings the ball up here, and then as he steps and throws, the ball ends up at about this location right here. So you can kind of see that the ball is going to start up here, and then it's going to come down as he throws it to that point right there. Now, we're not doing anything with spin. We're not doing curveballs or any of that stuff, knuckleballs. We're just looking at if it was just a straight ball, straight fastball from here to there, how much work, how much energy, how much force would he have to exert on it to be able to get that. Now, hopefully, you got the idea that I'm talking about energy here because that's exactly what we're going to look at when we're trying to do this calculation, okay? So what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about what types of energy are present at each of these points. Now, we're going to start up here. Now, at this point, remember, that's when he had the base, when I have the baseball up here. So at that point, there's no kinetic energy. It's essentially at rest right before I start to make that launch. So there's no kinetic energy there. There's no springs, which means there's no elastic potential energy. So all we've got there is gravitational potential energy. Now, it's gravitational potential energy because it's got some height above the ground. Now, we're going to come over to this side, and as he releases it, it's now a lot lower than it was. So, it's going to lose some of that gravitational potential energy, but it's also going to gain some kinetic energy. So, at that point, it's going to have both gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy because that's when he releases the ball. Now, obviously, during that whole process, he's putting some force on that ball to get that ball to speed up more than it would if he just dropped it and it went from this gravitational potential energy to that gravitational potential energy. All right, so now at this point, we can see what types of energy it has. So let's find out how much energy it had at each of those points. Now, one caveat here is I am ignoring the pitcher's mount. Okay, I understand that in real baseball, the pitcher stands on a mound. The mound is about 25 centimeters above where home plate is. I'm ignoring that for a couple of reasons. One, the, the uh, rubber that the pitcher is standing on is a little bit behind that, and so it's a little bit lower than that 25 centimeters. And also, as they step, they don't step all the way down the mound. And so rather than worry about that, we're just going to look at this basic principle here. And so it'll allow us to approximate the amount of force. All right, so here we have gravitational potential energy. So that is going to be based purely off of MGH. So at this point, I do need to measure how high that is. And so I can go from the ground. Here is one meter right here. And then I measure from that one meter up to the ball. So that is, oh, I guess I should start with the zero down there. That is all the way up to 82. So this is 1.82 meters up in the air. All right. Now we go to this one over here, and we find the gravitational potential energy at that one. All right. And so we're going to go again from the ground. The ground will take us to this point right here. And then from there, oh, that's a little bit low, sorry. From there, we're going to measure up to the point, which is right at 40. So that is... 1.40 meters up in the air. And you may wonder, well, why'd you put this zero? Well, because it is right at 
the 1.40, 1.40 centimeters, right? It's that 40 centimeters. I want to show that I actually measured it to that centimeter. So that is then how much uh, height it would have at that point. So now I can go ahead. Remember, the question here is how much force does the pitcher exert? Now, as the pitcher exerts force, he's going to cause the ball to gain energy that wasn't there before. So really what I'm doing here is I'm going to find the overall, and this is how we've defined it before. We said that work is equal to the change in energy of the object, right? Now, work we also defined as being the force times the distance. So I can find out the average, now this is the average force being exerted by the pitcher, times the distance over which that force is exerted. That will be equal to the change in energy. Now there's two types of energy that are changing here. Okay, We've got the gravitational potential energy that's changing and the kinetic energy that's changing. So the change in energy is going to be equal to the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the gravitational potential energy. All right, just like that. And I'm actually getting really close to where I can start putting some numbers in and maybe be able to answer this question. So the force, that's what I'm looking for. How much force is the pitcher exerting? Distance is the amount of distance over which the pitcher exerts force. So that would be from here all the way down to there. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can measure that. So I'm going to try to do my best just to measure from there all the way across. Oh, it's a little high, so let's lower it a little bit. Looks like it's 1.78 meters. So that distance from here down to there, the distance over which the pitcher exerts the force is 1.78 meters. All right, that should be equal to the change in kinetic energy. So that's going to be the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy plus the change in gravitational potential energy, which will be the gravitational energy final minus the gravitational potential energy initial. All right, so we're getting really close. We go force times 1.78 equals kinetic energy final, which would be 1 half times the mass, which was given to me. That's the 0 0.150 times V squared. And the final velocity is the velocity on the release, which we said we want to do a 90 mile an hour fastball. That's 40.2 meters per second. So 40.2. So that's 1 half MV squared final minus the kinetic energy initial. And remember, initially I said that there was no kinetic energy because there was no speed before I started throwing it. So that'll be 1 half mv squared. That v is going to be 0, so no kinetic energy. So we'll just take that guy out. Plus the gravitational potential energy final. Remember, gravitational potential energy is mgh. And so it'll be the mass again, which is that 0 0.150. Oh, 0 0.150 times g, which is 9.8. So the height there was 1.40, sorry. Minus the initial, final minus initial. So again, we'll just go 0 0.150 times 9.8 times the height there, which is 1.82. And so at this point, we can actually solve for all the numbers and then that will allow us to eventually solve for F. So I get that the force times 1.78 is equal to 120.5856. Uh, sorry, not Newtons. That would be a change in energy. We don't need to worry about that yet. Then we divide both sides by 1.78. And we get that the average force required is 67.7 newtons. How about that? How about that? We were able to estimate how much force is required for a pitcher to throw a 90 mile per hour fastball. You may say, well, that's not a lot of force. Well, you have to continue exerting that same force all the way from here all the way to the end. 
So that's a long distance to be, to be able to continue exerting exactly that same force. At some points, you're probably exerting a little bit more, like near the beginning as you really start to whip it, and at the very end, you're probably exerting a little less force as you're fully, exert, uh, for, fully extended there. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, Mr. Bauer, I don't think I can do that by myself. It's fine. You don't have to be able to do that by yourself. I did this just kind of, I wanted to walk through this one with you to show you that we can use the same principles that we were learning with toys to be able to talk about things in sports. We were able to find that force, what force is required by the pitcher in order to be able to do that. So there's kind of some neat things that we can do, and we're going to be looking that out over the course of the rest of this whole unit, is our different, what are some different places, different ways that uh, sports can connect to kinematics and energy and Newton's laws. And then we'll add in a couple other things as well, just talking about how can we apply physics to sports. All right? So I hope that was somewhat interesting. I hope it was helpful. I hope you noticed how we were able to use those things that we've learned before to answer some new questions. All right? Now, I do want to mention one last thing before I go. I didn't know if you, if you noticed, but you know we said that the height was 1.40 meters here and we said that the height was 1.82 meters here. Now, I'm actually standing on the second floor of a building right now, the school. Now, that means that this is actually not 1.4 meters. It's 1.4 meters plus however far it is from the second floor down to the ground, right? Why is it okay for me to do this? Well, the reason is because it's not really about how much energy here is here. It's about how much does the energy change? Right, so this doesn't include the whole first floor, but neither does this one, this 1.82. One of the interesting things with energy is that very often with gravitational potential energy, you can define where your zero is. Now, I defined zero as the floor here in the classroom because that was pretty straightforward. However, you could have also done it this way. You could have said, well, this is the lowest that the ball ever goes. So I'm going to find this, I'm going to define that as zero height. Now, if you define that as zero height, that means you wouldn't have gravitational potential energy at that point, which is kind of weird to think of, but remember, gravitational potential energy depends on height. So we could define that as height zero, and then that height zero would go all the way across, and then all we would need here is how high did it start above that zero point? And you'll notice that 140 and 1.82 means that this is about 0.42 meters. And so in your calculation, you could have said, well, my final gravitational potential energy is zero because that's at my height of zero. So this guy actually goes away and I don't need that. My initial gravitational potential energy, instead of having 1.82 here, we'd have 0.42. And we would get exactly the same answer. In fact, I challenge you to try that on your own. Go ahead and punch in these numbers. Don't use this. Make that zero gravitational potential energy and change this to 0.42 and show that by defining a different zero point, we still get the same answer. That's going to be really important as we start to get more into energy, especially when we get into our theme parks unit later, where we want to be able to define a zero wherever we want. That will greatly simplify your life, all right? So once again, I hope that was kind of interesting. I hope the overall idea was helpful and that we start to open our minds a little bit to how else can we use the physics that we've learned. See you next time.